Okay, so good afternoon to all of you. So today we are going to look at a psychiatric assessment. And I am very sure that most of you might have um, learned how to do physical assessment. But what happened is that because you do it so physical, now you're going to look at the mental health aspects of the patient. Remember in health, the definition encompasses or reveals more of physical health, psychological health, which is mental health, social health, and then spiritual health. So the question is that how best can we assess somebody who might be experiencing mental health problems or mental illness if in case you happen to come across such a person? So basically, when we say psychiatric assessment... Uh, please, your voice seems far from your microphone. So we can hardly hear you. Hey, seriously? <laughs> please hold on. Let me call IT to solve this problem. Hello, can you hear me now? Is it loud and clear, please? Am I audible? Yes, yes sir. Yes, sir. It's better now. Okay, it's better now. <laughs> okay. Anyway, sorry, it's, it's one of those things about IT and all that. Thank you, sir. Okay, so I'm saying that we are going to look at um, psychiatric assessment. And uh, we're going to look at the different um, ways of conducting the assessment. So in the first place, before we can conduct a, a psychiatric assessment of any patient, we need to have a setting. The setting is what gives room for us to start, or it makes it possible for the patient to open up, or the informant or whoever is giving you the information to be comfortable enough to give you much of the information that you want. So when we want to set, yeah, create a setting for our patient to speak, it simply means that we ourselves, we should understand the kind of patient we are dealing with. We have to deal with ourselves first, knowing very well that this kind of patient may not give us all the attention because sometimes we feel threatened when we are getting close to patients that have psychotic problems. But whatever it is, whether the patient is walking into the consulting room or is brought at the emergency, it is very important that you still create a, a possible environment, what we call a therapeutic environment, for you to engage with the one who accompanied the patient or including the patient who voluntarily might have come to the consulting room. So first of all, we should understand that patients may not give us our full attention may not give us our full attention. And so by discretion, we will think about how best to go around it. So how do we do that? We start by establishing a rapport, greeting, introducing yourself, asking the person, how best can you support or help the person at this particular time? Once you have introduced yourself and you have created that um, engagement and you are telling them that you want to support them, now they will tell you that this is what is happening to the patient. Uh, this thing started this time and it has got worse and all that. Now, your skill is that you're supposed to use empathy. You're supposed to use, um, you're supposed to be compassionate. You're supposed to have a listening ears, like an active listening, okay? Without prejudicing the patient. 
And then you also need to watch your body language yeah. in order not for the patient to yeah. think about the fact that you might have taken the symptoms for granted. Because remember, body language sends a lot of signals to our patients. Can you please um, off your mic? Thank you. So I'm saying that every nurse needs to be to, to demonstrate empathy, compassion. Once you have empathy and then compassion and then a good listening ears for you to listen to the patients. Whereas you don't actually need to interfere. The interference in between is when you want to pull more into the information that you need. So once you have set this stage, now we can go into um, get much of the information that we need. So basically, when we talk about uh, psychiatric assessment, we are just having a we are just taking a comprehensive uh, uh, examination of the patient, and that involves both qualitative and quantitative data. The qualitative there is simply telling us about the interview session that is ongoing. That is, uh, we are going in to take a history of the patient and at the same time, we'll make a mental status examination. Whereas when it comes to the quantitative data, what has got to do with numbers and scores, it means that that's the time that we are administering um, standardized psychological instruments, what you guys call questionnaires. That is what you administer to the patients or the family for them to answer. Once they answer the items that you have provided on the questionnaire, at the end of the day, you make a score. Every score has got its range. So for example, if you are using what we call the PHQ, the PHQ simply means patient health questionnaire. Um, the version seven is used to measure more of anxiety and then depression. So based on the scores, you'll be able to know whether patient is uh, mildly depressed, mildly anxious, or has moderate depression or has um, severe depression. So that is when you are using uh, a questionnaire. And so that is that gives you the quantitative information that you need. So basically, it is just composed of history taking, conducting mental status examination, and then administration of standardized psychological instruments. And I give an example like the PHQ-7 that you can use. I don't know, what's our break? Oh. How about Steve-O? I don't know where we are. Hey, if we talk about our pal. Hey, it's the Nam. I still get interferences. Okay, now, Let's look at how to take the information when it comes to history taking. The word is history, which means that we are going back to time and we are much concerned about the present, not the future. That is history. So going back into time, we want to take certain information regarding the patient's um, psychological health and physical health and surgical health. Then we're coming back to talk about the present or the current presentations that a patient is I mean, the symptoms that the patient is exhibiting currently. So we first start with the informant. Now, the informant is the very person who is different from the patient. Remember, most of our patients, because they exhibit psychosis, they may not be in the right frame of mind to give you or to tell you whatever is happening to them because they just deny. They have poor insight into the condition. And so they may not be able to give you um, a good information about what is happening to them currently. So somebody stands in. That person can be a spouse. That person can be a partner. That person can be a family member. That person can be a relative. That person can be a co-worker. It can be um, a neighbor. It can also be um, probably a teacher or a lecturer who br brings this client in for an assessment. And so the information can be taken from that particular informant. Now, normally we write that I see. And so sometimes you may hear them say things like this. For example, 
The informant may tell you that this patient doesn't come to work. This patient does not sleep. The patient has been disturbed and praying all the time. The patient forgets about some of the things she needs to do. She has to be prompted before she does it. Um, she's crying with everybody. She's suspecting people. She has neglected a child. Now, it's very important that if you are taking the information from the informant, you will not paraphrase it, but you quote it exactly as the informant has said. We realize that when we ask people to paraphrase, sometimes they leave other informations that are necessary for us to understand what the, um, um, the informant is given. The same information can be taken from the patient if the patient has a good insight into his own condition or voluntarily came to, uh, to the hospital for treatment. And they may also tell you that, doctor, I have not been able to sleep for the past three days. My father passed away. Um, I've had problems with uh, sleep. Uh, I cannot eat. Uh, I'm not motivated to do anything. I've lost interest in stuff. I hear voices. I see visions. Now, so they themselves, they can actually tell you. Now, when the patient also tells you, you are going to quote it as it is. You, you have to quote it as it is. So apart from the informant, you just move to the past psychiatric history. Now, the patient has given you... The patient has given you the information concerning what is happening to him now. Now, you want to go back into time and ask that, okay, so for how long has this condition been for you? How long has it been in the terms of duration? And when did it start? You want to know the onset. Is it insidial? Is it gradual? Or is it chronic? You want to understand how it started. And then possibly you can ask the patient, what do you think even brought about this? Do you think because your father passed away, do you think it's spiritual? Do you think um, because you're not be having enough sleep, that is why you're not able to concentrate? So sometimes you can probe in to ask the patient some of the precipitating factors that might have led to the onset of these new symptoms that is exhibiting. Once you are done with that, you come to the past psychiatric history. With the past psychiatric history, you want to know whether the patient has been admitted before and why he was admitted, admitted. The diagnosis, you want to know. You want to know the medications that he was given. And you also want to understand if he was able to recover and possibly whether he has taken the medication for a long time or he just stopped taking the medication. That is leading to the current um, relapse symptoms. So it's very important that we understand the past psychiatric history. So somebody can tell you that I was admitted at Pantan, I was admitted at Ankafu, I was also admitted at um, Ka. I've been at Kolebu before, I've been at a Doom clinic, probably a few quanta, I was admitted there for about three good days or a week. The doctor told me that I was suffering from bipolar, I was put on, on lanza pain, I was also given the depot. I was fine. Um, after three months, uh, I was able to return to work, but after taking the medication for some time, I decided to say that, okay, fine, because I'm well, I don't need the medication any longer. So I stopped. Now, this information can come from the patient or a spouse or any other significant person. They can also give you the concrete information about their past psychiatric history. When you are done, you move into past medical history. You want to know whether the patient has been diagnosed with HPT before. Um, you also want to understand if the patient is diabetic. You also want to know whether the patient has um, a neurological disorder like, uh, like um, epilepsy. You also want to know if he has suffered from typhoid fever before. You also want to know if he, was, he has been diagnosed with HIV before. Now, for the medical history, it gives us a clue. For the medical history, it gives us a clue as to when somebody has HPT, we are very careful about some of the medications because they can either raise the BP or they can reduce the BP. For example, when you put a patient on clopromazine, there's a tendency for that patient to be to experience um, hypotension. At the same time, we are also uh, aware that HPT in people who are above 60 years, uh, when not controlled well, they 
are likely to experience vascular dementia, which is quite common. Or anybody who suffered from stroke uh, can, can also experience what we call um, post-stroke um, depression. So HPT is very important that we get to know. Diabetes is also an important one because most of our, some of our medications can also lead to type 2 diabetes. So we want to know whether this particular patient is diabetic. Now, typhoid fever and all that, we know that they are connected to mental, some of the mental disorders like delirium. So we want to understand that. Now, it's also important that you go back to look at the surgical history. Surgical history in the sense that has he got a fracture before? And if he had a fracture, what was the cause? Now, in the case of somebody who is epileptic, you know that because of their fall, it can lead to fracture, it can lead to bruises, can lead to lacerations where all those suturing comes in. If the person is uh, an alcoholic, chronic alcohol abuser, there's a tendency for him to experience withdrawal or in the point of intoxication, he may fall into a gutter and break the leg. So we want to understand this. Now, there are also other times that people have had surgeries. If in the case of a woman where the person had a total hysterectomy, if it's total, it means that both the ovaries and the, the fallopian tubes together with the um, uterus have been removed. And we are aware of the effect of estrogens um, on, um, on the mood of a woman. Uh, when the estrogens are low, it, con it, it, it leads to um, some form of anxiety disorder. When I come to the anxiety disorders, I will explain it in details. And then also, you also want to understand that if a person has had thyroidectomy before, low thyroid um, hormones um, lead to myxedema, and myxedema has something to do with um, some form of depression. So we want to understand all these um, surgical um, surgical histories so that we can link it up to whether it is a predisposing factor or something that we need to look out for, or it is totally linked to the mental illness. Apart from taking the past medical history and surgical history, we come back to look at the developmental history. The developmental history, normally we use it for children and then adolescents. Uh, we use it for children because of the neurodevelopmental disorders that are present in children, in, including some of the communicative disorders. So if you look at uh, common mental disorders that or neurodevelopmental disorders children suffer from, you think about ADHD, you think about um, autism, you think about intellectual disability, you think about communicative disorder or what you call speech disorder in children or developmental delay disorders in children, cerebral palsy and all that. Because of that, in taking developmental history, you want to ask questions like, with a child born full term, you also want to ask if the child experienced birth asphyxia at the time of birth. You also want to know if this particular child was able to suckle, whether the reflexes were there, moral reflexes, but uh, other quality. Is it Babin's key um, reflex? And then you have some other reflexes. ONG will give you all the information concerning reflexes. So you need to understand that these things need to be present. And then you want to know when the child was able to go on the side, lie with the belly, okay, crawl, sit up, stand, take the first walk, whether with support and all that. You want to also understand if this particular child was able to mention um, two syllabi words like mama, dada, was, and also was able to um, communicate socially with other children, including adults and can sense danger. So this is part of the developmental delays. If something has delayed, if the child chooses to walk at the age of two or three years, that should tell us that there are challenges. If the child is not able to speak well in terms of language use or understand the use of language, okay, the child always isolates itself, uh, himself or herself, it tells you that there has been some form of developmental delay. So we can also talk about when the child started his first school. Okay, it's part of the developmental history. So that, that is about the formative years. 
apart from that, we come to the family history. When we talk of the family history, you're looking at the, the whole family that, it, uh, that this particular patient belongs to. You want to know the birth order of the clients. Is it the first born? Is it the second born? Is it the first male or the second male? You want to know his position. Third, fourth, or first male or second male? You want to understand because birth order has been linked to our personality and it is also a risk to some of the mental disorders that we can experience. So there's a book on birth order. I think when you check on Google, uh, Google, you'll be able to get that kind of a book and then you know how birth order influences our personality. So we want to understand the personality of the, the birth order of this particular patient. We want to know um, the number of siblings. We want to know the family financial status. We want to know whether parents are alive and um, whether any of them has suffered from mental illness before and in the past. Because there are some families that you will be informed that the, grandma, uh, the mother suffered from mental illness. Okay, or, father, or probably the father is an alcoholic. Um, you get to understand all this. If the father is not present, then you know that uh, if it's a single mother who raised a son, then you are aware that for all what you know, this child has developed this antisocial personality because the father was not present. I mean, it could be possible. So we want to understand all these dynamics and we want to understand who is financing or who is supporting, how the family sustains itself. It's part of the family history. Then we come to the social history. Social history is talking about the client himself. Is he married? Is he working? Is he in school? Is he a student? Okay. Does he have other responsibilities? What are his hobbies? We want to understand all these dynamics in terms of the social history. Then you come to substance use. Okay, I think I was trying to take one of your friends out because he was disturbing me. Richard, your mic is on. Please, if I see your mic on, I'll take you out from the platform. Thank you very much. So substance use, substance and alcohol um, use. We want to also know if the patient is taking alcohol, whether he takes alcohol and which type and how long he has been drinking. You also want to understand if those alcoholic um, beverages he takes has led to intoxication or has, he has experienced withdrawal with these um, alcohol beverages. We also want to know if he has been taking hard drugs or illicit drugs like cocaine, like uh, pethidine, um, tramadol, like heroin, um, and all those other um, illegal medications that people um, abuse, and whether it has, it has had effects on them. And then we come to the forensics. Forensic is about legal issues. Whether this person has been jailed, has been a counter back um, in remand, whether he has served a community sentence as a result of um, a legal issue, we want to know this, whether he has raped somebody before, whether he has um, been in a fight, which led to a court case, whether he has become violent because before he has vandalized. People vandalize, but it is not reported, right? That is fine, but we still need to probe further to know if it has something to do with the police, whether the person was arrested. So if the person was, as a result of his behavior, then that needs to be captured by you. Now, pre-morbid personality, when we use the word pre-morbid, it means that before the disease. So normally we ask the parents or the accompanying person that how was your son 
before this particular presentation. Now they will tell me that, oh, my son is very jovial. He used to watch football. He goes to school and comes back. Uh, he's always happy with people. He likes doing this, likes doing that. However, since the onset of this particular um, psychiatric problem, he doesn't visit his friends. He's always indoors. He locks himself up. He doesn't come out to eat and all that. So that gives us a clue to the premorbid personality. So that is about history taking. Are there any questions so that I can address them appropriately? Then we move to the next. Please kindly enlarge one of the slide. No, no. Don't display or display only one at a time. Are there any questions before I move to the next, please? Sir, I have a question. Kindly go ahead. All right. So my question here now is in situations whereby we are assessing a client, now we will need... Um, social history, family history, but here is the case, the person who we inquire this sort of information from is the same person who is sick. How then do we correlate what the person, the informant is saying to get a definitive diagnosis for our patient? Okay, if I heard you, it means you are asking if what the informant is saying is true. Basically, something like that, yes. And then um, the screen, the phone can be rotated so that um, one slide can be shown at a time, if that will help. Okay, so it means that uh, your class professor is responsible for that. All right. Okay, so what happened is that you can only fall on the informant at that particular time because you need uh, an information, right? But then again, know that after you have conducted your MSc, or you in, yeah, with the MSC, which comes with the interviewing of the patient, it will confirm what the informant might have said. Okay, because when you are interviewing the patient, you ask questions like, I'm told you are not been able to sleep. What do you think about it? Or what do you say about it? So the patient might com confess to tell you. Now, sometimes you even ask them that, do you use substances like cocaine? The patient will deny and tell you no. But you pay your discretion. You know that these are withdrawals of cocaine. So it's quite obvious. So you take the informant's information, but you are going to cross-check it with the mental status examination. Are we okay? Yes, sir. Yeah. Now, if, if, if you feel you need a reliable information, for what you know, it's just because the person got aggressive just because the person got aggressive, okay? Okay. Just because the person got aggressive, the teacher might have rushed in to bring the patient. Please, you get it. So yeah. the, he would he is going to give you a very brief information of what happened pre presently. However, the other information might be taken from a reliable source. That is somebody who actually lives with the patient. Do you get uh, me? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's just like, uh, please, do you work in the ER or you're yeah, in the medi medical or surgical ward? Hello? Yeah, I'm asking you, are you in the ER or you work in theater or work in surgical ward? In, in a Where? In a medical okay. ward. Okay. Now, so, so just imagine that a client comes in with a friend. And they asked that she was he or she is unconscious, but they asked the friend that do you know whether he's diabetic or has HPT? Now the person tells you that he said, I really don't have ideas about it. Whether he's diabetic or is, but it simply means that we still need to go ahead and treat the patient, isn't it? Yes. So when we are done with that, we take the information from a reliable source. That's the that is to call a wife, to call um in maybe every, any significant other who the patient uh, is known to, and that person can confirm to give you more history. Are we okay? So normally you take the history, but then again, as the patient is on admission, 
you come to confirm some of the things that has been said or you fill in the gap. For instance, the past psychiatric history, the patient might have told, the friend might have told you that they don't even know if the patient was admitted and even the diagnosis, they don't even know. Okay? They don't even know the medications he was given, but they know he was sent to anchor home. So normally when we write, we write medication, then we put a question mark over there. But then we write something else, then we put a question mark over there. We don't know the diagnosis. However, in the course of treatment, his mother, who may be reached after, may tell you that, oh yes, he was diagnosed with this. Then you come back to come and feel that gap. Are we okay? So it's, it's going to be a continuous process. Please, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much. What's your name? Derek, please. Derek. Yes. Okay, Derek, thank you very much. Any other questions, please? Any other questions, please? Sir, Any other questions? Expansion of the premorbid personality again. Okay, the word is pre. That is before the disease. That is all what it means. So before the disease, how was the person? Do you understand now? Yes, please. Thank you. Okay. So my question to you is that how important is the family history to somebody that you are taking, um, I mean, someone with a, a mental problem, how important is the family history? Yes, Stanley. So some conditions run through family. So once you take the family history and then you know maybe a family member has had such condition before, uh, you can you can be able to also educate the 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 patient and the relative about how it came about, and also get the treatment from there. Thank you very much. Can I have another something different? Zita, Zita, what's the importance of taking a family history? Zita, what's the importance of taking a family history? Sir, please, to know if it, uh, if it runs through the family. Yeah, and to know how to go about uh, treating it. That is very true. But I need you to add another. So can I add something again? Please go ahead. Exactly. Uh, sometimes we, we also educate them. Uh, some conditions uh, can be inherited from uh, maybe the mother's side, some too from the father's side. Some too can be both. If maybe uh, both family has such conditions and then uh, you it happened that you find yourself there, that means you have a, a hundred percent of uh, the children having uh, the same, the condition repeating or most of the family members or the kids having it. But maybe if it's happened that it's from maybe one side, then it might be 50-50. So we can also... Much. Okay, thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, can I have another? Sir, let me also add this. Uh, okay. It also guides us to what prescription is good for the client. Uh, in addition to what my friend says, like if a person uh, is diabetic or is uh, hypotensive, Giving a a a, a lagatil might worsen his situation. So you as a nurse taking the medical history 
who also help you in that sense so as to not do harm to the client. Okay, thank you. Can I have another? Okay, so um, to, to add up, I, I would say, uh, let example, a patient who is suffering from um, seizures or epilepsy. You see, when, okay. Um, okay. when it occurs in the house, um, the patient might not be able to recall the time and um, what exactly happened during the uh, relapse. But then a relative or someone close to the patient who was there at the moment can tell you the uh, extent or the severity uh, and the time that it happened. So they will be able to give you a fair idea of uh, how it happens, the relapses the patient goes through anytime. And that can help you conclude on uh, what you have to do for the patient or the severity of the patient's condition. Hey. Lydia, Prince, thank you. Lydia, Emisa. Call, call. And I would like to add that history taken, you are trying to get a diagnosis. So if you find out whether there is a family related uh, condition, then it would be time to rate. To that condition, maybe the seizure, there are possible causes of a seizure. So um, finding a family history that is related to the seizure will draw your attention that it's a family problem and not related to other conditions. Thank you. Thank you too. Now I want to bring your attention to this. The family is supposed to be together. If you have a dysfunctional family, the support for the patient will be a problem. So normally when you take a family history, you want to also understand that this particular patient can be supported. There is somebody else who can support the patient. Now, imagine that somebody comes to the hospital, the person is admitted, and there's no family relative to come and support in the, the patient. Because remember, when you have, if you take a very good family history, the patient tells you, I've got two sisters. Now, where are they? They're in abroad. So who's, who's supporting you here? I'm the only one. It means that this person has not got support. Now, that will give you the opportunity to explore in the social life by coming to the social history to see whether he has got close friends or he's in a relationship. If there is somebody, you can actually tell him to reach out to other people who he knows is closer for them to come in. It's like we are in a hospital, people come, um, others visit them, others they don't receive any visits and we actually don't care about it or we don't actually pay attention to it. But we know that it has got effect, it has effect on the patient all because we don't pay attention to taking on the family history. Probably you would say that it's for the medical side for them to take the history. But I'm telling you that smartly, we can also take admission, we can also take a history of a patient where the patient comes on admission. Unfortunately, we are not yet designed um, a format for taking our history to include that kind of family history. But if you have, in certain settings where you have uh, family history being provided and all that, it's not just about the, the disease that is present, but you also want to understand the dynamics of the family so that you can use the dynamics to, to, to support that patient. You understand where the patient is coming from and how best you can use it to support him, right? Because you just add this up to what I explained earlier. Now let's move to the mental status examination. Um, those of you who raise your hands and all that, thank you very much. Let's move into a mental status examination. So when we are having a mental status examination, we want to know the current mental state of the patient. The current mental state of the patient. Now I want to ask just the simple questions. When you have a patient who is experiencing sickle cell crisis, when they come to your ward, what will be the first thing you are going to see about that particular patient? Your observation. I'm not talking about physical science. So I want something that is related more to an, an outward behavior and um, something that you think is, is linked more to the psyche of somebody with sickle cell crisis who comes to your ward. Well, we so, 
or is isolated? The person with the sickle cell crisis isolated. Is that what you're saying? Yes, sir. Why are they isolated? Like, in which form do you see? Like, in such a manner, they seem themselves not to be worthy of the people around, or they are not able to be in comparison to the people around. So they seem themselves to be, to say, introvert type. Okay, okay. Let me let me help you. You are you're on your journey. Um. However, the word is they become withdrawn, not isolated. Withdrawn is from within. So that that is it. They feel withdrawn. Okay. Please sir. Yeah. Please sir, can you take your word again? Yeah, some the of word. them to so, sir. You the word you wanted to use is withdrawn. Withdrawn. Okay. okay. Yes. Please. Okay. Thank so, you, sir. So thank you. Yes. The next. What do you see? Yeah. Please, please sir. Yeah. You know, like the crisis. You said crisis. So the crisis. Some it, when like and when they are in crisis, they are in pain. So Very you good. see that some of them, especially the, the children, some of them will be crying. Good. Crying. And what else do you notice? Okay. What yes. else? Okay. Do you what notice? else do you notice? Depression. No. Depression. Please, no, please, please, depression. Please, 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 never use depression because the word depression simply means that you it meets a criteria for major depression. So maybe you want to say low mood or sadness. So that's more okay. appropriate. Yeah. Okay. What else? They become restless. Very good. What else do you notice? So the kids most of, most of the times they they tend to seek for attention unnecessary. They they sometimes become hysteric. Okay. What else do you notice? Mood swing. Can you describe that, please? Say like when they're in the pains, you see them to be very angry, but when the pains move away or when the pains goes out, they like they can be laughing or playing with you or something like that. Oh, that's fantastic. I like this class. Yes, what else? Yeah. Keep it coming. Hey, they are mostly irritable. Okay. And then what else? What else? This I've, I've, I've only entered into they your medical need world. They crave for attention. They always need assistance. They always need assistance. So they, they keep calling. Okay. So which means that, but there was one thing that probably you, you it has escaped you guys. When they come, how is the official expression? Moody. How is the official expression? It's more of their pain, right? Pain. Very good. So if somebody comes and then what happens if a pregnant woman walks into your somebody who is in labor, how do they walk? They'll be oh. dragging their feet. Very then, slow. Do they bend? They walk do they day. bend slightly? No. They bend back they, course. They bend in the backwards. waist. Good. What else do you see? They'll be moody. Okay, so um, what I want to, okay, so thank you very much. <laughs> now let me talk. <laughs> what I want to say is that the appearance of a patient is very important. Whether you are taking over and seeing the patient for the first time, or the patient is actually coming in for admission, it's always important that you look at the patient, right? The appearance of any patient, even including your colleagues, would tell you, sometimes you're working with people, you see them for the first time, or maybe you meet them another time, you're like, mm, Charlie, your hair, Charlie, what happened with your dress? You may not even ask the person verbally, but you may say in your head, like, hey, what's happening here? Is this person okay? We are not okay. on the ward only to just check vital signs and give medications and follow up with, uh, how do you call it? with um, diagnostics for us to be chasing lab and all that and coming with x-ray calling the doctor and intervening and writing our nurses notes and all that. Sometimes you need to observe the patient from afar. A patient bends like or they coil in a fetal position. What does it mean? What does it signal? 
to you. Imagine you come to the ward, you see that one patient has is in a fet fetal position. What does that tell you? They are sad. Or what if the patient in pain? They are in pain. Thank you. They are in pain. What if the patient is looking away from the main door where you have that mean the entrance? He has turned away. Not in mood. sleep, oh. he often doesn't look at the door. He turns away. Mood. Not in a good mood. Very good. So appearance is very, very important. And for us, mental status examination starts exactly when you meet the patient, not when the patient comes to you. Looking at the patient from afar before they even get close to you, you have already started your mental status examination. You want to know the current state of your patient. That will give you the opportunity to engage or know how to engage with the patient. Because remember, there are some patients who are not even psychotic. Sometimes they are very moody and they may give you chicken answers straight away. All is because probably you fail to observe the state. So let's start with appearance. Appearance talks about all what we can see about the patient. And uh, we are looking at the demographics. Um, in psychiatry, the demographics are very important. Where the person is coming from, um, the culture of the person is very important. So if a person is living around um, a Babu area or any uh, Muslim community, that should tell you that this person probably might be a Muslim or because he's living within a Muslim community, he's bound to dress that way. And so we cannot judge that person. It means that the dressing should be appropriate. When I said appropriate, it should be culturally defined. It should be religiously defined. Then again, it should have something to do with the age. It should be age appropriate. And then also, it should match the weather. It should match the season. We cannot be having wedding and then you dress like you're in the house or you overdress at a party, okay? It has to suit the occasion, the weather. I'm using the weather because it cannot be all the sunny in Ghana and then you wear um, light shorts as a woman with a bomb bomb. It means that you've got um, a heavy, you know, hips over there, but you wear a shorts with bomb bomb and then part of the bath is coming out and then you wear a sweater on it as a top and then you, you are in heels with a braided hair with different colors in it. And then you put on, um, how do you call it, your dark sheets. The question is, where are you going? I mean, do you think this is appropriate? So you just need to know that it needs to be age appropriate. You need to look at the time. You can look at look at the season. Look at look at the day. You need to understand where the patient is probably coming from. Is it coming from a Muslim community or a particular community um, that gives him the opportunity to dress that way? Now, think about a dressing where um, somebody wears coats before he puts on uh, a T-shirt. We know that we wear the T-shirt before we wear the coat. So in that case, that should tell you that it's inappropriate. What if the person is wearing the dress inside out? What if he's wearing a lot of clothes on? We, we don't have winter here. We don't go down um, 20 degrees. In Ghana, normally we are around... We are above 20, 20 degrees. We don't go down like when you're in UK, you happen to have um, negative one. Currently, it's even negative three to four um, in Birmingham and all that. But we don't have such weathers, except the person is probably sick and, and is having fever. And so he may dress and wear two to three, um, you know, put on shirts and all that. But if the person has put on too many clothes on, having his luggage with him, you know, look at this um, personal hygiene. The personal hygiene itself is not well maintained. The grooming is poor. The hair is unkempt or is a bushy hair. The person has odor. Um, the posture is that he was shuffling when he was coming, he was limping and all that. Giving us a clue of pain. That should tell you that there is something wrong in terms of their appearance. And you need to document without judging. You don't make um, 
deductions from what you see. You rather document what you see exactly as it is. Prince, kindly go back. Kindly go back. I'm not done. Now, if the person abuses substances, you know that people want to abuse uh, alcohol beverages, for instance, acquisition or drink spirits. Normally, the chronic ones, they are emaciated. You can see that they have a dry skin. You can see the cheeks are puffy. And sometimes the leaves becomes reddish. Sometimes, I'm using the word sometimes. Uh, and then they also get anemic. Uh, when it comes to those who use their other cocaine and all that, they also lose weight. Okay, and sometimes when you look at their, their, their hands, you will see if the person is using a needle, you will know it. Uh, for those who smoke weed, sometimes they look so dark. Um, other times their eyes, be, uh, their conjunctiva becomes reddish. Um, uh, other times you can see that their lips becomes black uh, or dark. And then sometimes the tips of their fingers becomes dark. Um, for a woman who has been uh, engaging in self-harm right. behavior, she may be cutting herself. The uh, wrist. Right. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, yes. sir. You are loud and clear. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. So for a woman who has been uh, in, engaging in self-harm behavior, she has been cutting herself with blade, okay, or has attempted suicide before by tying her hands, uh, a, a wrist, and all that. Sometimes you may see the marks, okay? For a woman who has been abused, you also see it from the face. You may see it around uh, the arms area if she has got fractures. And all. So on appearance, when somebody is coming, you just need to look at the person. And whatever you see is what you write without prejudice, without making a deduction. Just write it as it is. Now let's take somebody who is also epileptic. We know that because people can, can experience serial epilepsy. Okay, you may see bruises on the face. So most of the time, it's like they have this particular mask or label on their faces that when they appear, we know that no, this person is probably um, someone who suffers from epilepsy, right? So just as you see it, you write it as it is. That is about appearance. Now let's go to, let's go to behavior. Please, if I see that, if I see that you are disturbing me, I'll take you to um, room waiting. I'll make you go and wait. Okay, now let's come to behavior. Now, behavior is everything you put out there that we can see, we can notice. Everything you exhibit that we can see is your behavior. Now, a behavior is different from attitude. Attitude is a form of behavior that is exhibited when you interact with a person or when you engage with a person Hello. in a particular moment. That is attitude. So for example, maybe the first time some of you maybe probably might have come to my office uh -huh. when you are submitting. I keep having these interference. Oh, so somebody who comes to my office for the first time, maybe the person is submitting his assignment. When the person comes, I said, do you know that the deadline is passed? That was yesterday. And now you're submitting this particular assignment. Get out of my office. Now, this is the first time the person has encountered me. He goes back to tell his friend that, listen, this particular guy is harsh. He's very hostile. Like, he's not friendly at all. He's, like, he's so disrespectful to his students. Okay? That is my attitude. That's what you, 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 you go to tell somebody. Now, another person also walks in after three hours. And I see the person. I said, oh, Cheryl, how are you? You're fine. Are you not telling your... But why are you doing that? Now, oh, say I want to tell you something. I said, okay, fine, sit down. She explained and all that. And I said, do you even need coffee? Do you want us to bring you a drink? 
And I was so good to that particular student who walked in. And all of a sudden, she was like, oh, okay, thank you, sir. She submitted her work and she went out. Now, that same girl also goes to tell another person that, ah, say is so good. He welcomed me. He did this. Now, both of them have experienced two different behaviors from me. And in that time, it is not my actual behavior because behavior needs to be very consistent, right? But an attitude is a behavior exhibited within a particular situation when you are engaging or interacting with somebody. So normally when we are taking the mental status examination, we need to take both behavior and attitude at the same time, right? Okay, so let's look at behavior. Now you want to know how the patient was behaving when you saw the patient. Now you want to know the facial expression. Expression. As this, you know, is he having a blunt face? Is it like he was smiling? Is it like she was sad, angry on the face? You just need to, or the face looks so stressed. Okay, because you can have a stressed face, an unhappy face. Describe it as it is. Patient was not smiling. Was not putting up any smiling face. Yes, he has a frowned face. You just write it as it is. We also want to know about when you were establishing the rapport, whether the patient was friendly to you. If the patient was not, if the patient was unfriendly or was hostile to you, you need to document it that this patient was unfriendly or was friendly, okay? Now, you can also think about the eye contact. There are some people who look away when you are talking to them, you realize that they may still glances at you. Others may feel shy, okay, by looking away from you. Some may gaze totally away from you while you're talking and, may, and maybe start talking to another person, okay, as a result of the stimulus. I mean, the auditory hallucination that is taking place. So we want to know whether the patient is confident enough to look into the face of the therapist or probably looking away or bends their head down. You need to document that. Now, another behavior can be the mannerisms of the patient. Um, is this something that small time he taps his leg or taps on the, the hand or hits another person or a little time then he watches his father, a little time he turns his father, that becomes the I think we went off. I'm very sure that it's the light, but we are back. Okay, so I'm saying that when it comes to movement disorders, we are looking at tics, okay? And tics is involuntary repetitive movement or voice. So for instance, people who experience tics, with tics, which is also known as Tourette's syndrome, if, if they are talking to you, they may voice out a particular word because it comes in like... Um, uh, somebody has hit you to shout and that can be repet uh, repetitive so for instance as i'm talking if i'm saying that okay joe is gonna come here today why would the patient shout come here immediately that should tell you that the person is experiencing takes and i'm very sure that um those of us those of us who may be watching these series uh, on movies you may come across takes you may come across atasia um, atasia is the um, inability to have coordinations. You may also have somebody who's experiencing dyskinesias, which are involuntary um, tremors and then um, movements of motor, uh, motor movement on the face. So you have, may have the patient uh, moving the lips up, up and down, like a lip smacking movement and then tongue coming out and all that. It's part of the movement um, disorders. Now, there's another one known as the level of arousal. The level of arousal is not arousal as in sexual arousal, but it's looking at, um, we're looking at the alertness of the patient, the consciousness level of the patient. 
how calm the patient is when you start engaging him in conversation or whether he was very agitated. Okay, that would determine the level of, 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 of arousal and whether the patient was even in a stupor. Okay, you need to describe it in terms of the level of um, arousal. Then we have one other known as the disinhibited behaviors. Disinhibited simply means that we should be able to control, okay? We should be able to control our behavior. We should be able to control our uh, emotions. So when we are not able to control our emotions or the behavior, it means that we have become disinhibited. It means out of control. So a patient who, imagine somebody engages in a fight and you're trying to separate your friend. The moment you're trying to separate and pull him back, he pushes back into the fight. And you're just telling him, John, you need to stop this fight. Stop it. I've asked you to stop it. And then he still goes in. That alone should tell you that at that point, the patient or the friend has become disinhibited. So anybody who engages in violence and cannot be controlled, and sometimes patients are not even aware of it, it means that that person is disinhibited at that particular time. Okay, and normally you can find it in um, patients that experience bipolar, specifically mania. So that is it about the behavior. From the behavior, now let's go to speech. Hello, let's go to speech. Please, please uh, can you explain the mannerism again? Yes, I explained it, giving it an example that when it comes to mannerism, you need to watch what the patient was doing continuously from the time that you are talking to him. He might be tapping his leg or probably using his hand to hit on the, the table. Or sometimes he may be looking away several times. He may look up and then turn his head down, look up and then turn his head down. That becomes the mannerism of the patient at that particular oh. time. Okay, sir. Okay, okay, you thank you. Thank you, sir. Yeah, now let's look at speech. Now, as I said that, there is no way we can know what is in the minds of people, except when they speak. And that is actually true because I don't know your thoughts, but until you are able to say something, before I know what is on your mind. So when people are talking, the essence of speech is for us to know how the person is speaking. What is he even talking about? Is the speak link up to uh, an aggression? Does it depict anger? Does it depict sadness? Okay, so by understanding the dynamics of speech, we'll be able to know the mood of the patients, the thoughts of the patients. That's why we look at speech. So in looking at speech, we look at the rate of speech. What does rate say? Rate wants to know whether it is fast or probably slow or it is pressured. Pressure means like in between the person is speaking very fast, but it's being pushed. Okay, so that is about rate. When it comes to quantity, we want to know the length, the amount of talk. So with that, you may have somebody who is very quiet, especially in the cases of um, poverty of thoughts. The person may not be speaking well. He may be taking it, what we call selective mutism. He may speak one after the other. He may answer you with few words. So you may ask the patient that, have you eaten today? He didn't respond. Did your mother come here? He won't respond. Then you ask the next question. Should we bring you a drink? Then he says yes. Now we know that this particular patient is experiencing selective mutism. The worst are also few. Unlike a manic patient who will keep on talking and talking and talking and talking and talking and will never stop talking. So we use the word over talkativeness, right? That is it about the quantity. Now let's come to the tone. Now, the tone itself is about the rise and fall, okay, of a speech. Um, it's almost linked up to the rhythm of a speech. And the tone will tell us that the tone actually conveys the way you speak to somebody. It is not the word itself that you convey. It is not the, the cadence or the, the inflection of the word, uh, in, but rather how 
it is put in terms of the voice of somebody to hear. So for example, if a patient is talking to you and lowers his tone and say, and say something like, what are you giving this thing? This is a rough tone with a low voice. Okay, so the style with which people talk. Now, sometimes um, patients can be demanding and we say the demand in the tone. If the patient says something like, as for me, I'm not going to accept this medication. I'm not going to take it. I'm not sick. That's the should tell you that this is a tone with anger. This is a tone with anger. Okay, so tone itself depicts some form of the rise, it's measuring the rise and the fall, but it also depicts how the patient is feeling at that particular time and how his thoughts is actually organized. So with a tone, we can know whether a patient is angry, we can know whether the patient is having a sense of humor. We can also know whether the patient is becoming pessimistic or has a positive attitude, okay? It's very important that we understand these things. Now, let's also look at the... Um, the voice. So the voice can be stertorous voice. Um, it can also be tremulous. The voice can be shaking when you are talking to that kind of a patient. So it's very important that we get to understand the voice. Sometimes within the, the tone and the voice are actually connected together. The phone can give you a very high pitch or can be a, a very low pitch. And the voice can also be high or low. And sometimes the voice can also be tremulous, which shows us something like the patient is actually afraid at that particular time. Now, from there, we look at fluency. Fluency is about articulation. How can this person actually speak so that we can understand? When we are speaking, we need to articulate. We need to be clear with our speeches. And so, if you look at some people who articulate, they flow. They don't. They know when to stop. They know when to put clarity to what they are speaking. They speak short, simple sentences, but they are all well connected for us to understand. Now, people who have stammering, for instance, you realize that the fluency is not all that straight up. There are breaks in terms of the latency. It will take time for him to come with the next statement. It takes time for him to come with the next statement. So fluency, an example, is somebody who is stuttering or experiencing stammering, okay? That's it about the speech. Now, if you look at all the things over there, you can see tremulous, you can see um, monotonous speech, you can see minimal, you can see quality, you can see slow, you can see articulate, you can see content, you can see um, pressured speech, you can see sled speeches. Um, you can see quiet, you can see clear and all that, right? So each of these four under the rate, the quantity, the tone, the voice, and then the fluency. Now let's move to the next. Yeah, <laughs> Okay, so we were talking about the mood, right? Oh. So we are talking about the next one is also look, looking at the mood of the patients. So we have got mood and then we have got an affect. Um, so the mood is more of something that is subjective, okay? It is what the patient is feeling at a particular time, right? So the definition for mood says that it's more of a sustained emotions, the emotional makeup of a patient or a client or an individual. And it is rooted in that person's personality or it is based on the current situation. Now, now, it's very important that we know how we point questions to patients regarding their mood. Now, if you ask somebody, how are you feeling today? 
How are you feeling today? Within our setting, it's very difficult for people to ask that questions like, how are you feeling today? Because we relate feeling to I'm well or I'm not well. Chale, how do you feel today? Chale, I'm fine, I'm fine. How do you feel today? Chale, I don't feel fine. Though. That alone should tell you that the wording of your questioning, that the questioning becomes a problem. So it's best when you ask people like, what is your current mood? Or how do you feel now with regard to your mood? So you are becoming very specific. And as I told you, a mood cannot even be seen except somebody tells you how he or she feels. We can also know if the person expresses the mood, which is known as an affect. Okay? So when you're asking people how they feel, add related to your current mood so that we can understand it better. So people can describe things like, I have a low mood, I'm apathetic, um, I'm anxious, I'm sad. Okay, my mood is flat. If your mood is flat, it means that I should be able to see it, not you telling me. And if it's elated, it means that you are actually in a good mood. Now, there are also some mood that is described as dysphoric. Dysphoric simply means that I am unhappy or I am unsatisfied. Okay? So the patient can tell you, Charlie, I'm unhappy, which means that the patient is dysphoric or I'm unsatisfied with life. It's dysphoric. Okay? You coin it as dysphoric. So that's it about mood. Now let's go to affect. Okay, now let's come to affect. I told you that a mood is quite subjective because until somebody tells you how he or she feels, you cannot know. But however, mood needs to be expressed. And when it becomes... When it goes into the state of expression, it means that it is an affect. And affect becomes more of an objective kind of a thing. Whilst mood is subjective, affect is objective because you can witness it. Now, affect, emotions, uh, what, what did I write? But they are not the same thing. Okay, affect is the observable emotion expressed immediately. Okay, so with affect, we are looking at intensity, quality, the range, and then you're looking at fluctuations. So when it comes to fluctuations, for example, we know that it's labial, what you guys call mood swings, okay? So people's mood can swing from being happy to sadness, uh, to being happy to being sad, okay? And it can be intermittent. So in the course of interview, for what you know, when the patient came, he came in involuntary. He didn't understand why he was brought to the hospital in the first place. He may not be happy, but while the interview is ongoing, at a point in time, you may see something that is very, uh, that has uh, a humor, okay? And then at a point in time, he may start smiling. So that tells you that the mood immediately might have changed or you might have um, talked about his strength or give him the opportunity to even speak much concerning his achievements. And that alone, when, he's, when he moves into his flow state, you realize that he start telling you about it with a good uh, mood. So we know that patient can switch at the beginning of the interview to the at last, or probably from the last level, or may maintain the same kind of mood throughout the time of the in interview. Now, if the mood is flat, flat simply means that it's very, very low. You may not see any other expressions. If it's blunted, it means it's constricted. It means that the person displaces limited amount of his feelings. So somebody who has a blunted affect, for instance, he's sitting in, um, let's say he's at a party and a normal circumstance he would have done or laughed over something, but he just smiles instead of laughing. But everybody knows that he could have. It means that he's trying to restrict his own emotions. Okay, at that point we say it is blunt or it is constricted, but if it's flat, it means it's totally low. You're not seeing any other expressions. And normally you see it in persons with depression, blunted, affect, you may see it in schizophrenia, and then at the same time, you may see it in persons who are diagnosed with, um, uh, with depression. Now, if you look at the quality, quality is telling you, uh, if asking of, is the person sad, is the person euphoric, is the person happy, or is the person agitated or angry? So that is, is about quality. When it comes to rage, um, it, it, rage is quite similar with, with intensity. Some other literature has that, Intensity and rage are quite the same. 
So just as I explained, blunted is the same thing as restricted. The person doesn't want to express much of his own emotions. Sometimes you realize that everybody is laughing at the interview except the patient. It means that he's trying to restrict his emotions. It means that the patient is trying to restrict his or her emotions. But now, when it is expansive, expansive, you see it in mania. The person gets into a heightened state of happiness where the, the, the mood itself becomes broader. It covers a whole range. Okay? And he may be going and pacing up and up. That's what you see in the behavior. Pacing, being restless, want to touch everybody, want to talk to everybody. At that point, it has become expansive. So with, with measuring both mood and affect, in manic phase, we normally say that the patient has an elated mood and an expansive affect, including becoming euphoric. People can be elated and expansive, but they may not be euphoric. Okay? Okay. So that's it about affect. Let's move to... Give me the other one. Let's move to thoughts. Let's move to thoughts. So when it comes to thoughts, they are classified uh, under four different um, components. You have the stream of thoughts, the content of thoughts, the form of thoughts, the possession of thoughts. So when it comes to the form of the thoughts, we are looking at how the patient is thinking, okay? How, the, how is the patient thinking at all? Is it thinking straight? All of us need to think linearly. But sometimes you have people who are skewing out of the line. When you're speaking to a particular patient and the patient is going round to give you, round and round before he gives you the answer. We call it circumstantiality, which you guys know. Not going straight to answer the question, but rather goes round it before giving you a straight answer. Now, tangentiality simply means that the person moves away from the topic and is not able to come back. Right, that's what you see in um, a form of a thought. There's also what we call the looseness of association, where you realize that the two statements made by the patient does not correlate. They have no coherence. In fact, it's become bizarre. They become disjointed. That is what we call loosening of association. You may also have flight of ideas, where many um, ideas flow in and out of the patient's um, thoughts. So those are examples of the form of thoughts. Now let's look at the stream of thoughts. The stream is looking at the amount and the speed of thoughts. And so we have got the poverty of thoughts. We also have many ideas, okay, that a patient might have. You're looking at if the thoughts are even pressured, pressured thoughts that are coming in. You also want to think about the thoughts that are being blocked. Now, in the case of anxiety, when you are writing an exam, just think about it. Sometimes the stream of your thoughts can be blocked. All of a sudden, the mind becomes blank. At that point, we say you have got a thought block. It can happen in schizophrenia. It can happen in anxiety disorder. It can happen in depression. In depression also, patient stream of thoughts may, may be described as a poverty of thoughts. That is why they may have limited amounts of um, words to give to you, okay? So that is about the stream of thought. Now, when it comes to the content, the content is looking at the idea that a thought actually contains. So are the thoughts suicidal, okay? Is it homicidal? Is it about self? Huh? Is it about delusions? When I said delusion, fixed false beliefs. I mean, when you talk about the grandiosity, you talk about um, people... Um, who think that they are not themselves in terms of the deep personalization. People think that they have taken another identity. They think they are rich people. They think they are princess and, and all that. Or they are delusions of ability. They think they can do a lot, either than the way they are, comparing it to their limitations or their strengths. And it's also, also obsessive. Obsession only talks about intrusive thoughts, okay, that you actually do not need and they are uninviting, and they are rep rep repetitive. They keep coming until you are able to act on it in the form of a compulsion. 
Now, overvalued thoughts. So overvalued thoughts are just a belief that a person has. It preoccupies that person's mind to an unreasonable extent. And when people have overvalued ideas, they are likely to pursue this idea. So let me give you an, an example. So for somebody who claims to say that um, the site of G, G, uh, the, the main site for uh, GCUC, which is Kumasi here, is more beautiful than Asenkwekwa. And so he feels more like he can come and come and influence the president of the college or the school to decorate that of As Asenkwekwa um, campus to make it more beautiful. Now, he travels all the way from Asenkwekwa and then comes to this particular campus to come and speak to the president, to tell him that there's a need for him to redecorate as a congress campus. Now, these are overvalued idea, ideas. These are examples because the person goes ahead to pursue um, these ideas that he or she has. Now, I want to differentiate the overvalued ideas from delusions. So when it comes to delusions, we are solely aware that it is more of something that is very fixed. And then it has no logical reasoning, okay, to the ideas. The person does not pursue it. The thing is that the person has it in his mind that this is it, but the person does not pursue it. And there's no reasoning to justify that, that he's a chief. But when it comes to overvalued ideas, there are justification and there are reasons that are provided, okay? So that is it. The last one talks about the possession of thoughts which means that they believe that others can manipulate their own thoughts. That means others can manipulate your thoughts or they can take your thoughts away or they can deal with your thoughts. They can go into your mind and then deal with your thoughts. Either they are putting the thoughts inside. It means that they are implanting the thoughts, which you call thought insertion, or probably they are extracting the information from you, taking the thoughts out of your mind. And then sometimes though, they may also feel like the thoughts that they, the ideas that they have has been broadcasted. It has been circulated. It has been spread. So patients with schizophrenia will tell you, or paranoid schizophrenia will tell you that the ideas that I have to write on the, uh, the paper, for example, if you're writing my paper, you left the paper blank. Why did you do that? You said that all the ideas that you want to write is being broadcasted. People are looking at their watch, um, the masalachi, People who sound their 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 they ring they they talk they how do you call it their bell or whatever it is. It's a sign that people have hear your thoughts, and so you decided not to write anything on the paper. We have had students like that, um, of course not from this place, but from um, some other place that we <laughs> consulted some some years back. People do not fill the paper all because they feel somebody else has the information that they wanted to say. So there's no need. Okay. Now it can get very severe. I've witnessed it. It can get so serious that you say that even the people are saying it on the television, tune to TV3, City TV, listen to Orange FM, Joy FM is even announcing it, it's even in graphics. The people are watching it on social media and all that, and it can be very, very serious, but all is um, due to the psychosis that is taking place. That is paranoid schizophrenia. It's very common among such group. Okay, so let's move to the next. Now, do you have any questions before I, I, I consider with cognition? From cognition, I think we have some other, some last two to deal with. Any questions, please, before I continue? Yes, sir. So with the history taking, I was also asking if the obstetric and the gynecological history is also very important. Yes, but I, I focused on that when I was teaching the midwives. That was about Friday. That was on Friday. For them, I needed to focus more on the gynecological um, history, right? But for us, 
uh, because we are dealing with just medicine and then surgery, surgical cases for the our focus is not so much on obstetrics and then gynecological cases. However, if the person had mastectomy as a result of oncological uh, condition, okay, we can rather look at that. Um, but as to whether the person has a stillbirth um, experience, a neonatal death, um, had miscarriage, self-injectomy, which is linked with depression, is in literature, it has been documented. Uh, but I didn't want to throw in that because of uh, the fact that you are algae and but it's also important. But I focus on that more when I'm handling the midwives. Are we okay? Okay, sir. Thank you. Okay. Now I want to ask a simple question. Do you think how does to what extent does candida infection? Specifically, the one that affects women, um, vagina candida, okay, candidiasis, that's the word, okay, link, uh, bring about depression in women, or probably anxiety. Do you think it has got a link? Hello? Hi. Hi. Yeah, yeah, I just asked a question. Do you think yeah, yeah, vaginal please. candidiasis can affect a woman to the extent that it can affect her mental health? Yeah, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. How? How? Yes, yes. How? Tell me. Uh, okay. Uh, wait, wait. I need, I need four people to do the, the input. So... Let's start with so this um okay yeah go ahead okay so the, from the uh, uh, my point of view I'm looking at it to be it it, it sometimes makes women so uncomfortable and they feel lower esteem when they are with their peers okay because any time oh. it has detects the, the 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 smell the itching and stuff like. Okay. It makes them consider themselves or their esteem very, very low and makes them uncomfortable. So it can lead to uh, anxiety or depression. That's the point. I can see it. Okay. Thank you. Can I have another input? Okay. Sir. Yes, you do. Okay, go sir, ahead. please. Hello? It can also affect their fertility. I'm talking about something that is more... more um, Psychological. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Anyway. Uh -huh. so, yeah. the person the person might lose maybe her husband. And the, the husband can also teach because of that. So you can leave the depression to the woman. Okay, okay. So it's a chain. Okay. Okay. The yeah. last so, one. I, I want the woman to talk. Hello, can you be taking from the point Hello, of the, the personal yes, complaining? The partner complaining about uh, the ladies' candida when they meet. At this okay. point, the lady tends to uh, always think about it when it's left untreated, leading okay. to depression or low self-esteem. Okay. The last hey, one. My point of view is yes. uh, since candida is an infection, mm -hmm. it can go into their blood as well, then travel to the uh, distant central nervous system, which can affect the brain of the woman. Mm -hmm. I see. That one, I have not come across it. Too. <laughs> <laughs> that it one, you see it in... It's, it, no, the, you see it in... It's can, this, uh, no, the the candida... Oh, no, the candida can have effects, um, especially when you are diagnosed with HIV, like oral candida and all that. But that, what I'm talking about is vagina candidiasis that affects women generally. Okay. Can I have a last, the last submission?
Say, please, some ladies are very shy to the extent that they can't discuss about their private part issue with other colleagues or even the medical personnel. They are very shy. I want so to keep it and be thinking okay. about it. Okay, yeah. thank you very much. Now, the reason why I brought this it's is for you, to, for you to know that when people are experiencing these things, give them the opportunity to express themselves, so give them the, create the atmosphere for them to speak and talk about it without judging them because they are not happy about it. Okay? It's very important that you pay attention to the psychological state of people and how they are responding to, how they respond to these kind of challenges that they are confronted with on a daily basis. Right? Now, let's deal with perception and then insight. And then we close. I think I can do that in five minutes. Insight. The extent to which the person recognizes and uh, appraises their, their experience. When we say you have an insight, it simply means that, number one, you need to accept that you have a disease. Two, if you have a disease, then that means that you need treatment. Three, you must accept that you are going to follow the treatment regimen. These are the three things that tells us about the insight of a patient. So patients might, might refuse to say that he's sick. A patient might refuse that once he's not sick, there's no need that he need medication. Then the third day, he won't even take the medication. I mean, that's a poor insight. Some will know that they are sick, but they will tell you that they are aware that they need treatment, but they don't want to take it. That's a partial insight. Okay. So that's about insight. These are the three things about insight. Now let's go to perception. When you're assessing the perception of a patient, you are looking at um, the hallucinations and then the illusions. Hallucinations where you think about the senses, you are using the senses, the auditory hallucination, the gustatory, you're looking at the olfactory, you're looking at tactile hallucination, whether things are crawling on the skin, whether it's the back, back flowing the skin, or they feel something crawling at their back or in their head, it's still tactile. Whether they are hearing voices, the voices that are can control them, whether it is a he or it's a she or it is they, that they are speaking about him, they are talking about him, you need to explore that. Visual hallucinations, you also need to explore that. Whether he's seeing things, what are these things? Is there many people? Is there strange things? And all that. So that's about perception. So perception boils down to thinking about the sensory. That's all. All the five senses. That's what you use for sensory. And then when it comes to cognition, we actually, well, the last thing was to talk about cognition. Cognition is talking about, please go to cognition, which is number eight. Yeah, Richard, talk to me. Oh, sir, I was going to alert you on the fact that you didn't tackle the cognition. Oh, okay, okay, fine. Please, let's go to cognition. Okay, so cognition is an awareness of self in an environment. So that's where you look at orientation. Time, place, person, and situation. It's not three, it's four. Time, place, person, and situation. Cloudness of consciousness. They want to know whether the patient is drowsy. Does he have a sharp memory? Um, in terms of, can he remember recent and past events? Okay, is he able to concentrate? You also want to know the stupor state. State where the individual is mute, is immobile, or irresponsive. Normally, the stupor, we take it under the level of arousal. But... In, your, in neurology, they bring it under cognition. Memory, assessing the immediate memory, the recent memory, and then the long-term memory. You also want to know, so when it's immediate, it means that a week ago, we should be able to tell you what happened. Recent means right now. If you ask the patient, okay, um, how did we get here? Okay, he should be able to tell you, that's a recent memory. Long-term memory are things in the past that you can explore. Where did you grow up? Okay, What have you experienced in the back? Can you describe something to me when you're in class six? Those things are long-term memories. Now, visual spatial functioning is the person must know the difference between um, what he's seeing in the ground. Visual spatial, you experience it when you are not able to determine distances. Okay, so for somebody who... Uh, for a chronic alcohol abuse who is intoxicated, when he wants to cross the gutter, you realize that 
a small gutter, he sees it too big or he sees it too down. And then he will try to raise his leg to, to, to jump over. Meanwhile, it's a very small gutter. So which means that he has a problem with knowing the differences or measuring distances. Okay, so that's about visual spatial. And then he said, well, be mindful that the general knowledge can vary depending on, give me, give me what is there. The general knowledge can vary depending on the culture, the ethnicity, okay, of the patient. So cognition, when you are assessing it, you look out for orientation, look out for memory, look out for special functioning. Some also look at judgment, okay, in addition.